All right, this is a video to help my students prepare for the quiz when they come back to school or for those folks that are looking to get a little bit of a help on solute solvents, solubility, polar molecules, and nonpolar molecules. So that's what the quiz will be on tomorrow. So let's quickly divide, divide this up into small sections to get a, a quick review on it. So the first thing we're going to review is the definitions of solute, solvent, and solubility. So the first thing is let's talk about solubility. Solubility is the measure of how well a, one substance dissolves in another. Basically, this is a relative scale, and it's also very dependent on the system that you're looking at. For example, salt dissolving in water uh, is fairly high solubility because we can get a lot of salt to dissolve in water. Uh, dissolving salt in something like oil, that would be a very low solubility because we can't really dissolve a lot of salt in oil. Um, so we basically have to define the system that we're looking at to determine what the solubility of the constituents are together. Now let's talk about what we mean by a solution. A solution consists of two things, a solute and a solvent. Remember, a solution is a homogeneous mixture of a solvent and a solute. The solute is the thing that's being dissolved. So it's the, it's the component that's being dissolved. It's generally the minor component, the smaller component, the smaller amount of component. And the solvent is uh, the thing that's doing the dissolving. It is generally the major component. A solute uh, does not necessarily have to be a solid. A solute can also be a liquid or a gas. And same thing with the solvent, right? So when you mix the solvent and the solute together and you get a homogeneous mixture, that is called a solution. And remember, a solution is the same composition throughout. Okay, so let's quickly look at a couple examples here. So remember, the solute is the substance that gets dissolved. So that's this material here, my, little, my spoon. I'm going to pour that into here and, and mix it up. And my solvent is the substance that's doing the dissolving. Again, minor component, generally the major component, and we mix the two together. We get a uh, homogeneous mixture of the solute in the solvent. So if we're talking about solutions here, let's talk about sugar water. Sugar, or my sucrose, would be my solute. Uh, the solvent would be water. Seawater, salt, most of it is, is considered to be no, sodium chloride. And then the water would be the uh, solvent. And vinegar, which is what we use for our salad dressings, uh, it's actually a, a, a solution itself. It's 3% of acetic acid, which is a liquid, in water. So vinegar consists of a acetic acid liquid water solution. Right. Another solution could be air, where you would have oxygen uh, dissolved in uh, nitrogen or mixed with nitrogen. Uh, and then you could have honey in water, things like that. So whatever's getting dissolved is the solute. What is doing this, what is doing the dissolving is the solvent. So now we're going to look, switch gears a little bit and look at how do we classify materials based on bonding characteristics. Now we've, we already did a little bit of a test on this, but this is a quickly review because this is going to become important when we talk about solubility. So remember, ionic, an ionic uh, material is any metal, non-metal combination, right? So it's a standard example we always use in class is sodium chloride. So here's my sodium atoms, or my sodium ion, sorry, the cation, and my chlorine ion, the anion, and we make a lattice of it. And that, and the sodium chloride itself has unique properties. Remember, it's an ionic material, so it's hard and brittle at room temperature. It melts and boils high, uh, has very poor conductivity in the solid state or just a couple of the properties. Um, so that's a standard one that we usually in class for our example, but there's other types of ionic compounds too that uh, we're going to be using more of as we go into solutions. And one of them is a sodium acetate. Now, the acetate is a polyatomic ion. We talked about them before. Those are covalently bonded materials that have, uh, when we're done with them, they have an ionic uh, characteristics. 
So that's an anion. Here's my anion because it's negatively charged. And when I combine that with a sodium or cation, I get sodium acetate. So it is a metal, non-metal, um, but it's not the traditional metal atom, non-metal atom. It's metal and then a polyatomic ion that consists of non-metal atoms. And then if we look at one little more th quick thing here, we can look at some what we're calling a soap, which is sodium stearate. And this is your standard soap, right? And if you look at it, you could say, well, there's a lot of covalent bonding in here, so um, why is it ionic? Well, because it has this functionality group here, the carboxylic acid or the carboxylate uh, thing. You don't have to know, know about that. But look, it's a polyatomic ion right here and has a negative charge, and then we have a sodium atom, which is a positive charge, so this is my metal, and this whole thing is considered my non-metal species, so therefore it is ionic. And we, since we have two ions, right, the stearate ion and the sodium ion, um, that's why we call it ionic. Even though it has all of this covalently bonded material in here, we still have an ion that's a still, it's still an overall an ion. Okay, so now let's look at polar molecules. Remember, we just got done ionic salts, right? A polar molecule is going to be a molecule that has covalent bonds only, and these covalent bonds are going to have uh, different properties for each bond, which is going to result in a electron uh, shift or a dipole in the molecule itself, okay? So there's going to be a shift in electron density from one side of the molecule to the other, based on the types of bonds and the location of the bonds and lone pairs of electrons. That's where the Vesper rules come into play. So if you look at acetic acid here, we could say that, okay, what is my central atom? Well, we could say that this is my central atom. So we have one, two, three of these things that are equal. So that's probably going to be nonpolar, and they're also carbon-hydrogen bonds, which we said are nonpolar. But this whole functionality here is different. So therefore, we're going to have, since it's not exactly the same and it's not symmetric, it's going to be a, a polar molecule. We already know that water is a polar molecule. We've done it several times because my central atom is not different, is different, has different things on it than the other things bonded. So we have four things attached to my central atom, two lone pair, and then two uh, hydrogen atoms. And since they're not all the same, they are going to be, it's going to be a polar molecule. And we do know that, that uh, water is very polar, and we also can draw the, the, the um, dipoles on it, right? Because this is my sigma plus. This means that the H is slightly more positive than the uh, oxygen, which is slightly more negative because of the electron shift. And you can say the same thing on this side. Remember, the electrons are getting pulled into the oxygen, so the oxygen is going to actually be more negative compared to the hydrogen as far as they're not sharing the electrons equally in this bond. The, bond, the electrons are, lay, are more on the side of the oxygen. Therefore, this is going to be slightly more positive. This is going to be slightly more negative. And again, this table sugar is the same thing. Look at all the OH bonds, right, just like this. These are all polar bonds. And there's many of them on here, so we, that's another polar molecule. And the other way you could look at it, too, is the following, right? If you consider this to be your central atom, this oxygen here, does this side look like this side? And the answer is no. So therefore, there is going to be a slight pole in this molecule, a slight electron shift from one side to the other. So again, a polar molecule, all covalently bonded, but it's going to be asymmetric, and it's going to have uh, asymmetric as in shape and, um, and bonds. And if you get in doubt, you can always use the Vesper rules to help you understand whether or not the molecule is going to be polar or not. All right, so we've already gone through polar molecules. Let's go through nonpolar, which is much more easy because there's only a few things that are nonpolar. One is anything that has only carbon and hydrogen bonds, which is hexane here, that we're going to consider that nonpolar. And, and then the other thing is, if we look at our uh, molecule, 
and it has symmetry around the central atom. In other words, everything that's bonded to the central atom is exactly the same. No matter what the bonds are, then it's going to be uh, nonpolar. So, for example, here, here's my central atom carbon. Is this side here exactly the same as this side? And you would say yes. There's no central atom, there's no lone pairs on the carbon. So, if I drew, put a mirror down right here, this would sit, look exactly like this. If I put my mirror right down the middle here, this side would look like this. And if I did it, you know, this way through the paper, it would look exactly the same thing too. So it basically is, is this side, is everything bonded to the central atom exactly the same? There's only two things bonded to the central atom, this and this, and they are exactly the same. Remember, all my diatomic elements here are always going to be nonpolar. So carbon, hydrogen only in the bonds, polar, nonpolar, sorry, nonpolar. Around the central atom, is everything bonded to the central atom exactly the same? And that includes lone pairs. Lone pairs are things bonded. Then if it is, then it's going to be nonpolar. And all my diatomic elements are going to be nonpolar. Okay, so now we know, understand how to classify a material as either ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar covalent as far as molecules, right? Or metallic, which we don't need to really worry about today. But the question that arises is, okay, so what happens if I have a mixture of material in there? I have a lot of nonpolar parts of the molecule, but I have a little bit of the polar part of the molecule. Is it polar or not? Well, the answer is twofold. The answer is, technically, if you have asymmetry around an atom or the, the molecule, then it's going to be polar. Characteristic-wise or functionality-wise, there is different degrees of polarity, and we're, we're, we're going to talk about that right now. So every one of these molecules is polar by technical definition because we have, if you look at about any of the central atom, let's say this is my central atom right here, this side does not look like this side. This is my central atom here. This side does not look like this side. This is my central atom here this side does not look like this side, right? And I can choose any central atom you want. You could choose this one and the same same thing, right? If I choose this, does this side look like this side? No. So um, there is an asymmetry in each one of these molecules, which means they're all polar. Now, what about the characteristics of the polarity? Remember, we said some things are polar and some things are not polar. And then, is there any difference between being more polar or not more in polar? And there is, right? And this has affects how a material behaves when we looked at it as far as solubility, properties, and things like that. So let's look at ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol is fairly polar because why? It has this polar group and not a lot of the nonpolar functionality behind on the other side of it. So it's going to be fairly polar. As we move up, the, the, the size of the alcohol, so we go for here for two carbons to five, one, two, three, four, five. Pentanol or pentyl alcohol is going to be much less polar in characteristics than ethanol. Why? Well, because we, have, we still have this OH group, but now we have a lot more of the structure is going to be nonpolar. Right? It's still polar molecule by technical definition, because it's asymmetric, because if I use this as my central atom, this side looks different than this side. But in reality, it's going to be more nonpolar in characteristic as far as properties, because it has a lot more nonpolar functionality than it does polar functionality. And we can keep moving up the line. This is octanol. This is eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <coughs> And so, therefore, this functionality here, again, if this was my central atom, this looks different than the rest of this, but there's a lot more nonpolar characteristic of the molecule than there is of the polar characteristics. And the last case here is stearic acid. Now, uh, stearic acid, you can see here, has a lot of the CH bonding here, which we all told you was all nonpolar, and it, and it does have a polar part right here 
right? So if this was my central atom, all this stuff looks different than this stuff. But there's so much of this nonpolar characteristic of this molecule that in reality, it's very, very nonpolar in characteristics as far as property wise. It's still a polar molecule by definition, but it's very nonpolar characteristic wise as far as properties. And that's a big thing that you have to understand. There are different degrees of polarity. Some materials are very polar and some materials are very nonpolar. They're still polar by the definition, but they're not as polar as others. Okay, so let's see if we can get you an example to show you what I mean by degree of polarity and uh, prop properties. So again, molecules can vary in the degree of polarity. So even though a molecule is polar by definition, it may not have a lot of polar characteristics as far as properties, right? So that's what I mean by varying in degree of polarity, right? The more polar a molecule in characteristics, generally, the more soluble it is in a polar solvent such as water. So let's see if we get an example here. Methanol is a simple uh, molecule. It has one carbon, three hydrogens, and this hydroxyl group, right? It's extremely soluble in water. It basically, it's 100% soluble in water. We're going to move up the molecular weight of alcohols to get to butanol. Butanol has four carbons in the backbone as opposed to one for methanol. One, two, three, four. It still has this OH functionality. It is less polar in characteristics than methanol. It's still a polar molecule by definition, but now we're only slightly soluble in water. And then if we move up to the octanol, which is eight carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we still have that OH group. It's very insoluble in water. In other words, it doesn't sol dissolve that well in all water at all. So we have extremely soluble, not very soluble. And then the degree of polarity goes from it's very polar to very nonpolar. Right? So hopefully that gives you an understanding of where we're going with the solubility and that polarity has a huge impact and the degree of polarity has a huge impact on whether or not a molecule can dissolve in substances.